This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and today we're going to take a look at the new Retina MacBook Pro, Apple's first super duper high resolution notebook computer. Is it worth the money? Let's find out. So here we've got Apple's hot new Mac laptop, the MacBook Pro with Retina display. This is a 15.4 inch notebook that looks a lot like, well, the 15.4 inch MacBook Pro. But it's thinner, it's a pound lighter, and it has this new Retina display. Now you're probably familiar with the idea of a Retina display from the iPhone and the iPad 3. And now it's a little bit confusing to have it in a notebook, and we're going to talk about that in detail. But what does it mean overall? It means really crisp, super sharp looking text, for one thing. Images look better, they pop a little bit more. This is also Apple's first IPS display that means wide viewing angles, as you all know. And in addition, instead of the usual three layers of glass that comprise like a MacBook Pro display, this one only has two, and that reduces the glare. So. You can't get this with the anti-glare display like you can if you custom order a MacBook Pro 15 inch, but the reflections really are reduced. It, I'm one of those people, I really like matte displays. I, I don't like glossy displays, and this one is pleasing me just fine. I totally forgot, in fact, that it had a glossy display when I was using it, so good times. The resolution on this is a mind-boggling 2880 by 1800. Now, you know how resolution works on computers, right? The, the, the higher the resolution, the more stuff you see on screen. Text gets a little smaller, sharper, icons get smaller, that kind of thing. Clearly, we're not talking about that resolution in a 15-inch panel because, well, effectively, you probably have two or one point text. Nobody would be able to read it. So what Apple's doing is the same thing they kind of do with the, the iPad 3 and the iPhone 4S. They're doing a sort of like... Uh, pixel doubling. They're, they're just increasing the number of pixels relative to the resolution that you've got. So the standard resolution this runs at is an equivalent to the 1440 by 900 that you would see on the regular 15 inch MacBook Pro. That means in terms of the text size, the icon size, all that kind of thing. But it's really running at 2880 by 1800 because it's doing that bizarro pixel doubling. Now right now we're actually doing a different resolution. We're going to take a look at that. Now for a Pro Notebook, it's a little bit funny that Apple kind of dumbs this down. We have best, we have more space, we have larger text here, and that really, it tells you the equivalent resolution over here. So on, if you notice over here, it's telling us. So right now we're actually running a 1680 by 1050, which is the high res option on the old outgoing MacBook Pro. It's still available with the updated MacBook Pro, in fact, if you custom order it. And that looks fine. Now you can go up to 1080p. And by the way, it's still pixel doubling. If you use something like Grab to capture a screenshot, it's going to show. It's going to make an image that's twice the resolution that's stated there. So if, if we grab the, the the 1080p right now, actually it's 1920 by 1200 because the aspect ratio on Macs is a little bit different from your straight 1080p display on your TV or most Windows computers. You're going to get double that in the number of pixels. Kind of confusing, maybe I don't know. Anyway, for those of you who have always been dying to have a 1080p display, or 1920 by 1200 in the case of Macs, on a 15-inch Mac notebook, well, here it is right now. That's what, actually what we're running at. So if you're going to run a, a 1080p video here, you're going to get the full thing without having to resize it actually running in the display, just like you can with some Windows notebooks, like the Sony Vio Z that we just looked at recently. And even if you're running at higher than the best retina setting here, which is the 1440 by 900 equivalent in terms of uh, text and icon size, that kind of thing. Even if you're running those higher resolutions, you are doing that, that retina increase in resolution, so you're still getting the sharpness there. Now you can switch down here to what I've been using at, which is again, that's 1680 by 1050, and that, that's a good mix between readability and getting more stuff on the screen if you need to do uh, professional work, that kind of thing. And of course, you can choose lower resolutions as well. Now, they have a radio button here, best for retina display, which is just going to put it at that setting right there. Or if you choose scale, that's how you get these various options. So I really like this. It gives you a whole lot of flexibility in terms of um, apparent resolutions, shall we say. You, you can do that, that 1080p kind of thing. You can do the, the high-res MacBook Pro 15-inch option resolution. Or you can just run it at 1440 by 900. No matter what, you're going to get that sharpening of the retina. Okay, hopefully that was a little bit clearer for you guys, and now we're going to switch to Best Retina, so you can see what that looks like. Nice big icons and stuff like that, easy to look at. What's inside the machine? This is Ivy Bridge. Apple just did a refresh of all of their notebooks to Ivy Bridge, so we're looking at a 2.3 gigahertz 
Core i7 quad core Ivy Bridge CPU with Intel HD 4000 graphics, a very capable integrated graphics chipset. If you've watched some of our Windows Notebooks reviews lately, you've, you've learned that that's actually capable of doing some moderate 3D gaming. But it also has dedicated NVIDIA GT 650M graphics. That's the new Kepler architecture, much more power and heat friendly with a gig of VRAM. Refreshing because Apple was always pretty chintzy on the VRAM. And uh, while Mac OS can make do with relatively little VRAM and they're not a lot of top tier 3D demanding games that run on Mac OS, a lot of people put Windows on it and you want that the, the additional VRAM. And it's also, it's useful if you're running additional displays. Clearly in the case of the Retina display, it's pushing so many more pixels around it needs it. And speaking of those pixels, right now we're unplugged, it's just sitting at idle, so it's actually running on HD 4000 Intel graphics. No problem driving those pixel around. It's very fast, it's very responsive. And we plug this into our 30-inch Apple Cinema display, so we're talking about running a lot of screen real estate there, and absolutely no problems with performance or with heat. The, the NVIDIA GPU is running around 50 degrees centigrade, which is perfectly reasonable, and doing moderate work. The CPUs were actually pretty cool for an Apple product. We're talking about mid to upper 30s doing light work, getting up into the 40s when doing something heavier. Now, if you do something like play Diablo 3, which we will show you, you can get it cranking up and getting uh, get those fans going, asymmetrical fans. Apple likes to make a big deal about that, so the pitch is not so annoying. But you can bring the temperature up to... Mm, 50s for game for the CPU and upper 60s for the GPU. Now the thing that'll really toast it the most is video editing. If you're working with 1080p video footage and make videos, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do with a quad core i7 professional machine like this, the GPU will go up to 75 degrees and it will be using the NVIDIA dedicated at that point. Those are the temperatures we're talking about. It's for the NVIDIA dedicated. That's still permissible. Uh, until you hit about 93 or so, Macs are usually pretty happy with the CPU and the GPU temperature, so we're talking just fine there. Refreshingly, too, because this has a metal bottom, as you would expect from a MacBook Pro, it doesn't get so hot. You can see there's no vents, there's no nothing. It's that usual clean design right there, the exhaust vents. You can take it all in the back here. But this does not get as painfully hot as some older MacBook Pros did. So the MacBook Pro with Retina display is available in two standard configurations, and you can build your own too. And also, Apple offers a well, max everything out G option, and that's three thousand seven hundred and forty-nine dollars. Whoa! You're looking at the lower config right here: two point three gigahertz Core i7 quad core NVIDIA graphics, all the good things that we mentioned. 8 gigs of RAM, 256 gig SSD, and that is $21.99. Now, that's a lot of money to spend on a notebook. But for those of you who are already going to get a MacBook Pro, I think once you start adding those options onto the regular MacBook Pro, say you, you decide, oh, I really have to have that SSD, or I certainly want 8 gigs of RAM, that, that kind of stuff, you're going to start pricing yourself back up into this category. So I think that Apple is really set up that once you start playing with various options, you're going to end up saying, well, the Retina makes more sense economically if you're already set on your MacBook Pro purchase for the 15-inch size. The more expensive model comes with a 2.6 gigahertz Intel quad-core Core i7 CPU, again, 8 gigs of RAM, and that has a 512 gig SSD, which, who wouldn't love to have that? Now, that's $27.99, so we're talking a lot of money there. You can go up to 768 gigs of flash storage. The flash storage is one of the most expensive options. You can get 16 gigs of RAM. Now, here's the thing. Everything is soldered on the motherboard. This works a lot like the MacBook Air in that respect. Apple has pretty much custom designed every component on here, and the RAM is soldered on the motherboard. So if you're going to run Mac OS primarily, honestly, 8 gigs is very good. Now, if you're doing some serious video editing on this, um, you might want to get that 16 gig option. It's not the world's cheapest upgrade, but again, you can't do it after the fact. Personally, I'm fine with the 8 gigs, but it's there for you if you want. 16 gigs is the other option. If you get that super duper maxed out option, or if you just build it to order, there is also a 2.7 gigahertz Intel quad core i7 CPU versus the 2.6 that adds on $250. Save your money there. You're really not going to notice the difference much, and that's what happens with Intel CPUs. When you get to the rarefied air of the fastest CPUs they can currently make, you pay a big premium for that, but you're not getting a whole lot of performance extra on it. In terms of design, you're basically looking at an elegant merging of the 15-inch MacBook Pro with the 13-inch MacBook Air. 
The design doesn't have the taper of the Air, so you're sticking with that kind of flat lozenge look that we've got for the MacBook Pro, but it's thinner. It's 0.71 inches, so it's sort of like shaving off the lid height on the existing MacBook Pro 15-inch. I'll show you a comparison in a little bit. And that 0.71 inches is just a little bit thicker than the thickest area of the MacBook Air, the back end where it's the thickest. Of course, it doesn't taper down to that razor-thin thing, but obviously it's very thin. You're also saving a pound of weight versus the 15-inch MacBook Pro. That's 5.5 pounds or thereabouts. And I did carry one around for years, and I can tell you, if you travel a lot, it really feels awful heavy. It wears on you. This guy is 4.5 pounds. When you start getting into the fours, you start getting to something that's pretty reasonable to carry around a lot. Now, this is not Ultrabook light. This is not Sony Vio Z light by any means. The Sony Vio Z is 2.5 pounds, insane, nearly half the size of it certainly is more portable. Now, it's not going to be nearly as portable as the MacBook Air either, which is hovering around 3 pounds, but if you need the processing power, and in fact, I was making do with the 13-inch MacBook Air for the last year, and I found that it certainly it's a capable enough machine, but if you're doing a lot of Photoshop work, development work, that kind of thing, uh, forget video editing on the MacBook Air. It's in a different class. So if you need to do those more serious tasks, you need the Pro machine and the Pro Machine is going to weigh a minimum of 4.5 pounds. Now as we take a look around, you're going to say, well, it looks an awful lot, again, like that 15-inch MacBook Pro. The design is pretty much exactly the same, just thinner and some changes in the ports. You've got that same lovely backlit keyboard here, the same glass multi-touch trackpad that's large and, well, it's just the best on the planet in terms of supporting gestures and just behaving nicely. Backlit keyboard, Stereo speakers here, good sound. We're going to play you a trailer so you can hear that. Definitely nice sound. Fairly thin black frame over here. Really a frameless design, but the black border around here is fairly thin. Closes with that nice thunk that you expect from a Mac. Usual back lit Mac logo over here, the little lip where you can pull the lid up more easily. Latchless design, as with most notebooks these days. So you can see it's, well, gee, really thin, especially for a powerful Mac. And if we take a look on this side, you can see here's a shocker for an Apple machine. My God, they finally put on HDMI port. If you want an HDMI port built in, this is the one and only Mac that has that. Now, other Macs have a display port, and you can, for 20 bucks pick up a display port to HDMI adapter, so that's not the end of the world, but it's wonderful to see Apple actually join the rest of the world there and put on HDMI. We have a USB 3.0 port here. This has two USB 3.0 ports, and you know Apple, they care about design and colors and all that kind of thing. Since they're both 3.0 ports, they didn't bother coloring them blue like you usually would find to indicate whether it's 3.0 or not, because either way, it's going to be. Here's your SD card slot, full-size SDX is supported, so you can put high-capacity cards in there. The usual black along the back and the rear. Beautiful, elegant looking machine, as always, from Apple. Here's the new MagSafe 2 connector. Uh, Apple said they needed to redesign it to fit on here. I'm really not so sure, because look how thin the MacBook Air is, and they fit the original MagSafe on there. So that means your, your existing chargers, they will not work with this. Uh, there is an adapter right here, though, that's about 12 bucks or 20 bucks, something like that. So you can use your existing chargers if they happen to match up with the right volts and amps. Two. Thunderbolt ports here, also working as mini display port if you're going to plug in an existing mini display port or display port based monitor like the old Apple Cinema Display 30 inch or one of Dell's fine 27 or 30 inch monitors. Here's your USB port again, the second one, and there's your headphone jack. And that's it, no optical drive here. You lose a pound in weight you all, and you get a thinner machine, but you also lose that optical drive and you lose the built in Ethernet, which is kind of a bummer. So once again, we have the dongle solution. Here it is. This is a Thunderbolt based so the connector there. Gigabit Ethernet adapter. Now that's actually a great improvement because USB is not nearly as fast as Thunderbolt. So if you're talking gigabit Ethernet, you want as much throughput as possible. So this is Apple's $29 accessory available now for those of you who need Ethernet. There will be a Firewire 800 dongle. Looks basically similar to this and that's supposed to be out in July. Now with these Thunderbolt ports, if you're kind of new to the Mac, Thunderbolt supports up to seven devices if you have a Thunderbolt hub or daisy chaining kind of setup on there. And of course if you get Apple's Thunderbolt 27 inch display, that one does have a Thunderbolt hub built in. So, there's that. 
And now we've got to compare to the 15 inch MacBook Pro there on the left and you can see that it's a bit thinner, certainly. Footprint is pretty much identical. The, the new one is just a little, little bit less wide than the MacBook Pro. One thing to note, by the way, I don't know how many of you ever use that, but the IR port is gone, so those of you who use the Apple remote, it uh, does not work with the new Retina model. And now we're comparing it with the 13-inch MacBook Air. At front, you can see, of course, because the MacBook Air tapers, how much thinner it looks. So, obviously, it does get thicker. That's why there's this little gap here, because it does have more thickness. This little skinny edge just kind of fools you. So let's take a look from the side. And there you can see the difference. And now, for those of you who are looking at machines in this price class, we've got the Sony VAIO Z2012. That's the Z3 3rd edition here on the left and the Retina MacBook Pro on the right, obviously. And there's, they should be about the same thickness. Sony says that theirs is 0 0.66, but you can see that, well, it's looking a little bit taller. That's the rubber feet on the bottom there. It's bringing it up a little bit, but the, the VIOZ is a 13.1-inch machine, so you're talking about a smaller display, a smaller class of machine, though also powered by a full quad-core Core i7 Ivy Bridge CPU with just Intel HD 4000 graphics. It doesn't have that dedicated graphics option there. But anyway, size-wise, of course, the Z is still going to be smaller. It has a very widescreen aspect ratio, so it's kind of narrow this way, wide this way. And we put them on top of each other. Significant difference in size, isn't there? Also, the Vio Z weighs only 2.5 pounds. But again, you're looking at a 13-inch machine versus a 15-inch machine there, so you can only get a 15 inch so light, especially when it's got full powerful internals. Now to get back to that retina display, applications have to be retina optimized, otherwise they just look average. In fact, they can look downright pixelated if you look really, really close. Now you have to have good eyes for this. And we're going to show you something uh, in a minute that's real interesting that brings that point home. But meanwhile, we have Google Chrome running. Now this is on the left, old Google Chrome standard. It's not retina optimized. And on the right we have Chrome Canary, which is their latest beta and does have retina support. And we're looking at the same page, so you can see what the how the difference in the text is. This is sharper, it's finer. This looks kind of, maybe a little bit bolder, but it's also fuzzier and less distinct. Now again, when you're looking at the display, like this, this size, 15 inches, you know, you'll, you'll see the difference. It, it's not, oh my god, maybe night and day kind of thing, but you're going to notice that it looks a whole lot better. Now when we start to look at this at 100% zoom, and I'll show you what I mean by that. You'll see the difference. So I took a screenshot of what we were just looking at using Grab, which is a Mac OS utility. And by, and by the way, the file size is twice the resolution there. And we're at 50%. And you're going to look at both of these and say, well, yeah, they look about the same to me. I don't know. But if we go to 100% to actual size, move that window around a little bit. Now you're going to see how much noisier the text on the left is. This is the non-retina optimized text. If we go down to something bigger like a headline, it becomes even more apparent. And now we've zoomed it up to 200%, and that's where most anything starts to look kind of crappy. But look at this. This is, this is the retina optimized right here, and it still looks great at 200%. You're just barely starting to see jaggies here on the big bold headline fonts, and this is absolutely falling apart. So yeah, the difference is really there. There it is, empirically shown. Now, as to how much your eyes perceive it, again, when you're just looking at the screen, normally you're going to say, well, it just looks sharper and crisper, and images look a little tighter and that kind of thing. Now, the other important thing to display quality is color gamut, how much of the RGB Adobe Spectrum you can see on the display. Now, Apple typically does well with color gamut on their displays compared to other PC notebooks. PC notebooks often only have 40% of the available color gamut, and the best would be still the Sony Vio Z. That manages 92%, which is just about unheard of, certainly way better than 40%. And Apple falls at the upper end of the spectrum, but they're still not going to hit what the Sony Vio Z display can do are Dell's high-end monitors, their 27 and 30-inch higher-end monitors that also have close to 100% color gamut. Still, it's very good. Your, reds, your Netflix red looks red. This is not an HP Envy kind of situation where the reds look kind of orange and, and everybody gets bent out of shape here. So, good color gamut, not as good as the Sony VIOZ. And one more thing to note, uh, sometimes IPS displays have a slight, slight mm, purple or magenta tinge. Just You'll notice it when you're looking at whites, and I can tell you that just having this next to my Apple Cinema display, 
that you can see the Apple Cinema display can display a pure white and this display does have a little, little bit of a color tinge on the white. As you increase the brightness that goes away, you'll notice that also on LCD based smartphone screens. Obviously you can handle Photoshop very well. This can, this can do anything you throw at This can do video editing with iMovie or more serious products. It can do Photoshop. It can do Photoshop very quickly. You've got incredibly fast machine, four cores, uh, dedicated graphics when you need it, and a fast SSD drive. Now how about video playback? We're actually going to, we're running at 1080p resolution right now, or 1920 by 1200, a little bit bigger than that. So you can see a whole 1080p trailer right here in the window. And you get to hear the speakers. You asked me once if I had told you everything there was to know about my adventures. Well, I can honestly say I have told you the truth. Very good black levels. Really, really good black levels. Black levels are more impressive than the white levels, honestly. Very sharp, and there it is, playing a 1080p video at 1080p resolution, or theoretically double that, on a Mac for the first time. The MacBook Pro with Retina display has dual band Wi-Fi 802.11bgn, that's made by Broadcom, and Bluetooth 4.0, also made by Broadcom. It has your iSight camera up here, otherwise known as webcam to you Windows folks. And it's available now. Well, kind of available now. There are a few of these actually showing up in Apple stores on the web now. It's a two to three week back order, the same day that it actually became released. And I wasn't pretty impressed with that. Given the price, I wasn't sure how many people were going to order it, but apparently a lot of people are ordering it. But if you run to your Apple store, call them up, bug them, you may be able to snag one sooner rather than later. We would show you Windows running on this because it's certainly a good candidate for that. Heck, this is as powerful as the HP NV15. In fact, the graphics card is a little bit better on this. But the bootcamp drivers aren't out yet from Apple, so we have to wait for that so we can actually have drivers to run it properly under Windows 7. And we will have a separate gaming video so you can see how Diablo 3 runs on this. Hint very well, and Diablo 3 actually is retina friendly, so you can crank it to some really high resolutions, which means sharper graphics, that kind of thing. Or you can actually run it at equivalent 1080p resolution and see more stuff on the screen. The battery, as ever with Mac notebooks, is sealed inside and uh, this whole section right here underneath, if you visit ifixit.com, they already have torn this thing apart. You can see all the internals on it. This whole area is taken up with a very interesting kind of multi-cell battery pack that fits in here. And Apple claims seven hours of runtime, which is pretty amazing for a machine with this resolution, this much horsepower inside. And so far in our tests, we're, we're seeing really good runtimes that may actually mean that they're not being too optimistic. There, You might actually get seven hours, depending on what you're doing with the machine. So this is Apple's first Retina notebook, the MacBook Pro with Retina display, mid-2012 as they call it. Again, it's available now. $21.99 is the starting price of entry, and you can... can get more expensive models with bigger SSDs, faster CPUs, all that kind of thing too, and spend your way all the way up to $37.49 if you want. Is it a great machine? Yes it is. Apple makes some fantastic notebooks. And this one certainly, as Tim Cook said, is their best notebook yet. It, it, it has a high price of admission, but if you can afford it, boy, especially if you run Mac OS, yeah, th this is the machine to get right now. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Visit our website for the full review, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.